Right now, we'd like to bring on a young man who believes in doing things his own way. And based on the way he kind of gets next to all of the folks who've seen him work, his way has got to be pretty hip. So let's lay some noise. Hey, welcome back, fellow Bucks fans. This is Outside Leverage Podcast. I am Robert Green, your host. We are now seven days away. Seven days away from the NFL kickoff week one for the uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers. It is 8.53 Eastern Standard Time. This time next week, we will all be talking about what went completely right and what went absolutely wrong. And people will be claiming or crowning the Tampa Bay Buccaneers either a complete, absolute bust of the free agency period and offseason, or we will be Super Bowl champions waiting to be crowned. That's how it goes in fandom, especially Tampa Bay Buccaneer fandom. We're either all in, all in winning or all in tanking one way or the other. Uh, that's what we'll be around this time, seven days from now, which is going to be high hilarious. Tampa Bay Buccaneers versus Saints week one. Uh, tonight, we have a, I have a very special insight. I think somebody who can give us a lot of information for, uh, for that matchup. Joining me tonight, I have Thomas Bassinger of the Tampa Bay Times. He's also key contributor to the Football Outsiders Almanac for 2019. Thomas has, has contributed to both the Tampa Bay Buccaneers side as well as the Saints side. So he's kind of gone back and studied both teams' tendencies, stats, everything, just to comb over the entire season to see what we can kind of get from that info from last season and what may carry over into 2020, week one, next week. Thomas Bassinger, Tim, how you feeling, man? Hey, Robert. Thanks for having me on, man. I can't believe football season. (laughs) I can't believe it's upon us. I know, right? After all this waiting, all the uh, ups and downs and question marks, it just it just may happen. They just may pull it off an entire season of NFL football. Got to get through week one first, which is next week. It's going to be crazy. I know. It is. It's been, what, seven months since we've had NFL football? It feels like 70 years. I know, right? It's been up. Uh, it's been... This is one of the craziest off seasons, period. And I mean, never mind, never mind just the NFL, just everything that's going on in the world, um, but including everything that's going on in the NFL, man, it is super crazy. And at the top of all the craziness of every single thing that's crazy in the NFL, there's nothing beating what the Bucks is doing. What the Bucks are doing, the Bucks are a part of every major headline that's happening in the NFL every single month. There's nothing bigger than what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are doing or what they have done. And that's, uh, for better or worse, man, that's, that's amazing. For better or worse, we the, we, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers fans, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, are the talk of the NFL. Crazy. It is. It is. I can't, uh, I can't recall a, a time, um, a time like this ever since since I've been uh, around the team and following the team that there's ever been uh, really a stretch like this where where the Bucks were just the the talk of the NFL, the sports world even at times. Um, you know, just you know, major headlines on on ESPN. Um, you know, everything from uniforms to uh, the quarterback and Tom Brady to kickers to running backs. I mean, it has just been, um, I, I can't recall an off season like this. I mean, it, uh, it unfortunately reminds me of, of uh, you know, uh, the, 
the Washington uh, off season, uh, maybe about two decades ago, um, and and the the Eagles team about ten years ago, the the infamous dream team. Um, so, you know, hopefully, um, you know this this Bucks team for the sake of Bucks fans, you know, um, doesn't doesn't follow that same path uh, and, and continues to remain relevant and interesting. Uh, well into the the winter and January and maybe February. God willing, because normally we are just trying to pray to get to mid October and not have to be looking at the draft. So yeah, it, it, this is definitely a, a different feeling. And and I usually for myself, I usually don't try to get. I make a concerted effort to not get caught up in the hype, not get caught up in in the talk and whatever. But um. I can't say I'm anywhere close to, to getting in that talk, but it's it's almost it's almost impossible to ignore how much how much hype is around this team and how much actual good vibes are around this team. This is a this is a different feeling. It's it's completely different. I think at least 2015, 2015 when the uh, the last franchise quarterback hopeful came in, where we felt like things. Were, it's going to change. Um, and then it was five years just felt so dark, but this feels like something completely different. Like it's, it's so, so ridiculous. The amount of talent, it's almost, it's, it's crazy. The amount of talent that is on this team, the potential that is on this team is completely through the roof. There's, I've never seen actually, I've actually never seen a, any football team in the NFL at the level that, that this team is, is in. But it's going to come down to a lot more than just the talent on the roster. It's going to come down to a lot of lot of issues that have to get ironed out. But on paper, which we love to talk about and love to crown um, teams and players on paper, there's nothing like what's happening with the 2020 Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, you know, ab- absolutely. Um, you know, the... You, you brought up uh, 2015 um, that season. I'm also right now thinking of the the 2017 uh, season coming off the nine and seven year. Well, was that yeah? That was nine and seven in, in 2016. Yeah, that was the hard knocks uh, off season, and and that was supposed to be the year where where the Bucks um, made the leap, right? Yeah. Uh, and and so. Um, and we were talking about a culture change that off season mm-hmm. and it wasn't, uh, it didn't take long before, um, I believe by that fall, we were hearing rumors of John Gruden's return to not just the NFL, but to Tampa Bay. So, so things turned, things turned, uh, turned ugly quickly, which just, just goes to show, uh, to your point. You know, on paper, there are just so many variables during the course of the NFL season, some of which are outside of a team's control. You know, your schedule, you know, it can it can it can look easy or difficult now. But but, you know, once you start playing the games, um, you know, teams can be, uh, you know, stronger than you thought. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and especially this off season, uh, Well, this season, uh, you know, who who knows what what impact. COVID-19 is, is, is going to have, I mean, you could, um, you, I mean, you could potentially lose some, some key, some key players to, um, to, to this virus. And that, and that, and that can change the outcome. If you lose, say your, your left tackle or, or one of your, your key defensive backs, that, that certainly can, can change the outcome of the game. So, um, you know, it seems as if, um, you know, the, the, uh, coronavirus hasn't, hasn't affected the NFL too much to this point outside of not playing preseason games. Mm. We'll see. We'll see once the season kicks off. Yeah. And the preseason games, though, those are more important than, than a lot of people probably recognize until now. Um, you know, especially when we got new players coming in the way that we do, like, cause we now not just have new players, we have basically new leadership on the field with the quarterback situation at Tom Brady, as well as Gronkowski, two guys who have, who have a, a winning reputation in the league. 
Um, and then the latter, who is coming off of a year's retirement, his not being able to play and actually get, you know, assimilated to preseason games and especially playing in the heat of Florida um, and training in Florida. That's uh, that's that's going that's going to end up it's going to end up being something to watch for to see how he holds up. Um, but yeah, yeah so, I'm not sure, uh, you know, what to what to make of this uh, this Bucks team just yet. I mean, of, of course, we, we we know the players, we know the names, uh-huh. um, but usually, you know, we we'd have four games, uh, four preseason uh, games to to kind of pick apart and and get some kind of feel for for this football team but like you know i i I wish i knew what what you know uh what was going to happen but like it's it's to me it's it's harder than ever you know september is is always uh a crazy month in the nfl full of upsets um and and uh, you know i think it's harder than ever to, to call now because we we have absolutely nothing to go off of other than um, you know, some, some names on paper. Right. And that whole paper champion deal, that's going to be, uh, <laughs> that's actually going to be the case for everyone because nobody's been able to see what the other team offers. And again, those preseason games, those are meant to see what you have as far as team building and team depth specifically to see who's who, to see who, who can come in when your starters are Robert? down. Yeah. Are you still there? Are you there? Hello? All right. Yeah. So again, just we got you know, we just got paper champs. So right now, pretty much every every team, we all we have is the rosters, and we don't even have that fully until at least Tuesday. Tuesday is the only is the last day or the or the first day that we can actually look and be like, okay, this may be the roster that the week one teams go in go into the game with. Uh, anything made after that is be you know pretty difficult, especially. You know, the can't the uh, Chiefs and the Texans. They got the first game up on an NFL kickoff, so they they got to make their decisions much sooner than that. All like they everybody has to basically prioritize getting their roster so quickly this year. It's, it's it's an amazing scenario. It is. It's it's so hard. Um, it's so hard to know what's 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 going to happen. I mean, it's always hard to predict September in the NFL. Um, you know, especially with these these different off seasons, but especially this different off season where we've had um, no preseason games, um, no real no real competition mm-hmm. to, to kind of kind of pick apart and evaluate. Um, so, I mean, really, anything can happen these these first couple of weeks. Um, and I, I see that the, the Saints are favored by, what, three and a half? You know, uh, it wouldn't surprise me um, if, if the Bucks pull this one off. Yeah, I'd be pissed if they don't pull it off. I mean, I'd be, I, and it, this is the first year. This is the first year I could think of in which the expectations are so, so much higher than I would have thought. This roster, the way it's built, and I have issues with the way this roster is built, but with all these names, all these winners, all this potential, it's—I don't even have the word to. I, I really, honestly, don't have the word to describe it. It's, it's amazing. It's crazy. It's almost a burden. It's almost a burden to have this much talent. So if, if the Bucks don't pull off, um. If they don't come out, if they don't come out swinging, looking good. It's just, it's just going to be it's going to be a little, it's going to be so much of a disappointment. There's going to be so much to be said about. It. And I know I mentioned earlier, you know, fans tend to go off the rails so quick, so fast, jump ship because of a loss. But overall, this team, this team has so 
much going behind it. it it's like every loss is going to feel like this season on the off season it's been like uh you know it's almost been a bad dream not a bad dream it's been like a dream that's not just not coming true and it's, it's it's so weird to say it. it's almost it's almost stupid but it feels like a dream that is just not coming true because this team feels like and i hate this term it feels like a dream it feels like a fantasy football team Oh, it certainly does. I mean, you know, you've got uh, <laughs> you've got Tom Brady at quarterback. You've got Leonard Fournette and LaShawn McCoy at running back, and Mike Evans and Chris Godwin at receiver, and Rob Gronkowski and OJ Howard at tight end. I mean, it really is a fantasy football team. Yeah, you wouldn't get the, you would not be able to pull this off in in a video game. You wouldn't. It's not a video game that's ever been made in which this would have made sense. You'd be like, yeah, this. This is real. Like it, it just wouldn't. It, it. I'm. St- I'm at a loss for words. Every time I actually think about it and speak on it out loud, it feels unreal. What What do you think would make it feel more real to you? I mean, do you just need to see Tom Brady, you know, throwing a football in a in a Bucks uniform in an actual game will, will it sink in then? Well, what, what needs to happen? Do you think for it to feel more real to you? For, for me, for me personally, yeah. for me personally, for it to feel real, like a lot of the stuff that's happened wouldn't, wouldn't just, it just wouldn't happen. Um, I would feel, it would feel real if, if I actually felt like there was an actual plan in place. But that's what makes this feel. That's what makes this feel like a fantasy to me. It feels like things are just being plucked out of the air. Like these, by chance, Leonard Fournette becomes available. By chance, Tom Brady became available. By chance, Rob Gronkowski came out of retirement. By chance, <laughs> Lashawn. I'm sorry, uh, Shady McCoy. He he's on the Bucks. Because um, some of these moves, I feel like, in a sense, almost don't. In a, in a world, they don't make sense. So it, I don't know if it's going to ever feel real. It's never is is it's, it's going to feel real, of course. Obviously, I apologize when the games actually kick off because it is what it is at that point. Um, but again, some of these moves it, it's just so unbelievable, unbelievable at this point that they've been made. Um, I don't. I just don't know how to say it feels real. It is just. It's beyond. It's, be, it's literally beyond my belief at this stage. A week before, I'm sorry, a week away from NFL kickoff in New Orleans, this roster is goddamn ridiculous. There's no way for me to describe it any other way. It's goddamn ridiculous. But they, bec- but with great power comes great responsibility. None of this stuff is a given. No game is a given. Especially week one, facing Sean Payton, an evil genius who I absolutely can't stand, and Drew Brees, a guy I respect but I can't stand on the field. Um, it's it's going to come down to what it's going to come down to a hell of a whole lot more than what's on your roster for week one, and that's why I wanted to speak to you about about next week. Um, again, you contributed to the. Football Outsiders Almanac. So you did a lot of studying between these two teams. Um, the the big the big deal that everybody want to look at, and understandably, the quarterbacks. Drew Brees again has had a hell of a good time playing against the Buccaneers. Um, this will be the sixth meeting that he faces a Tom Brady led team. Uh, right now, I believe Drew Brees has the three to two edge as far as his team winning. Um, these two guys, again, these two guys are being talked as you know first ballot Hall of Famers. The two of them, uh, both of these guys are like top five and I believe touchdown throws and and everything. These cats are so close as far as success. Uh, individually, with the exception of Tom Brady, obviously went in five more Super Bowls than than Drew Brees. Is what did you see from Drew Brees in your studying 
of his uh, of his play last year that he may, that may carry over to Week One against the Bucks. Like, what did you see, or like, what of his numbers stood out to you? Well. What stood out to me is that Drew Brees uh, doesn't seem to be slipping at all. Uh, I mean, he continues to be one of the most efficient and accurate quarterbacks in the NFL and has shown no real signs of decline. Now, it's, it's hard uh, for, for somebody like Drew Brees um, to, you know, uh, detect signs of a, of a decline because this, this isn't, uh, this hasn't been a quarterback for a long time who, who was chucking the ball down the field. Um, you know, his, his average depth of target has, has been low for, for several years. So it's not, it's not as though we've seen a drop in that. It's not as, as though we've seen a drop in his, um, completion percentage or expected, uh, his completion percentage over expectation, uh, all of his, uh, all of his, uh, by any measure, you know, he 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 is uh, the same uh, the same quarterback he has been for the for the last several years. Um, w- you know, one thing that stood out to me is that his average depth of target last year was six point seven yards, which ranked thirty third. Mm-hmm. But he was still. You know, one of the one of the most efficient quarterbacks in, in in the NFL. He doesn't need to throw the ball deep to uh, to be to be effective. Now, uh, compare that with with Brady last year. Brady's average depth of target was seven point nine, so a little bit more than than a yard uh, per per target than than Breeze. Mm. I, I'm expecting that to tick back up this year. You know, I, I'm not expecting you know. Brady to 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 be uh, throwing the ball down the field like Jameis Winston did last year, who had an average depth of target of ten point nine, ranked second in the NFL. Yeah, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see that tick up, you know, uh, beyond eight yards per target, eight and a half yards per target, and for Brady to rank somewhere around the middle of the league in that department. Breeze is still going to stay around, you know, that that uh, seven yards per per target. I I don't. Um, I don't expect that that offense to, to change all that much, but I uh, wouldn't be surprised uh, to see some some new wrinkles. One of the big things that that stood out to me, you, you know, watching the games, looking at the numbers, is just how heavily uh, they relied on Michael Thomas. I mean, to to the extreme. Uh, last season, they threw to Michael Thomas. You know, this is Drew Brees and T- Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, combined through to Michael Thomas 33% of the time, which was the highest rate in the NFL. 33%? 33% of their passes went to Michael Thomas. Now they threw to uh, the number their number two receiver, which was Ted Ginn, uh, 10% of the time, which was the lowest rate in the NFL. So there was there was some imbalance in their offense. We, we think of the saints as this, this multiple offense and they are, Mm -hmm. um, but they so heavily relied on, on Michael Thomas last year. Uh, you know, I, and, and yet they completed, you know, team defenses knew that the saints were going to throw passes to Michael Thomas and they, they still couldn't stop them. Um, but that, that, that imbalance really stood out to me. Um, and which is why I think, um, not not just in this game, but but this season. To me, Emmanuel Sanders, who I think is still a very good receiver, and, and made uh, helped transform that 49ers uh, pass offense last year. I, I, I really expect him to be, uh, you know, it's cliche to say the X factor, but I really uh, he's he's really the variable that I think this game could turn on. Um, when, when the Bucks kick off Sunday, you know, how uh, that, that just adds another element to that Saints, all, to an already very, very good Saints offense. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, now, I mean, that's a guy who can line up outside, inside, in the backfield even. 
you know, how, how you defend him and also, uh, you know, contain Michael Thomas, you're not going to be able to stop Michael Thomas, but, but if you can contain him, (laughs) um, you know, how, how you do that. And also, you know, there's, there's Emmanuel Sanders and Jared Cook and Alvin Kamara and Taysom Hill sometimes, you know, that's, that's really what the saints have going for them is, um, you know, you're, they're really going to strain defenses this year. Um, because they have so many, so many weapons, uh, and they can cause so much confusion before the snap. Yeah, which is something that Drew Brees has been has been known for. He, I mean, he can recognize a lot of defenses, and you know, switch in and out of plays, and and uh, you know, and adjust things pretty well. He, I mean, he's pretty active. He's pretty, he's pretty active before the snap, um, and that's something that the Tampa Bay Buccaneers has lacked. Uh, I'm sorry, have lacked for pretty much forever. Like there's not been a quarterback who can who can like notice defenses and actually, you know, make adjustments as well as any of the veterans that's been in the uh that have been in the in the division. That changes this year. Uh but going back to Michael Thomas real quick, Michael Thomas, man, I was thinking about this earlier, it's so much how it's it, he's so much like Julio Jones. Um uh, like everybody who played the Atlanta Falcons knew that Julio Jones was the guy, but you can't stop him. He's going to get his. It's like Michael Jordan or something like that. those. Those kind of players just exist where they're going to get theirs because they can, you know, catch short passes and and take off with it. Um, and that's kind of one of the dangers of playing with a, a quarterback as good as a Drew Brees because he can get rid of the ball so quickly and he has a target like Michael Thomas who can catch it and go. Um, that's a really, really big weapon in their offense with him and his catching, his being on the receiving end of thirty three percent of the offense. That's just really, that's crazy. That's super it crazy. It is. Uh, and, Here's some and, results. And and to 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 go back to your your point uh, a second ago about um, about the Bucks offense and 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 the pre snap. Adjustments. I mean, you're absolutely right that that hasn't uh, that hasn't been much of a much of a factor uh, in in recent seasons. And Arians said so uh, earlier himself this this past off season. He, you know, when he said that he was eager to see Tom Brady run the the audible system, our check with me stuff, the the quarterback puts us where the quarterback puts us in the best plays. He said we didn't do a lot of that. We did some of that, some of it last year, not a lot of it, which I thought was 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 really revealing, uh, and mm-hmm. and which uh, I, I think foreshadows, you know, uh, a big change in in this offense uh, this this coming year, whether it's it's pre snap motion, um, you know, uh, uh, audibles, um, you know, we're, we're I think we're going to have a quarterback um, who can. Um, uh, Manipulate defenses like we like we haven't seen in recent seasons. I mean, honest to goodness, I I think the last quarterback that I saw that was continuously checking out of plays, you know, I was just about to lie. Ryan is Ryan Fitzpatrick when he was in Tampa, he did it a, a little bit. He did it more often than the regular starter, uh, and I remember making note of that. Prior to that, it was third round pick Mike Glennon. And there's few appearances that he played in uh, in Tampa when he started, you know, all of uh, 2013 or whatever it was. That was uh, that was one of the quarterbacks that that was one of the first things that I noticed when he stepped in in place of um, the former starting quarterback number five back then was that he did a good bit. Other than that, the few times that Fitzpatrick did it, that was. Um, it was it. It feels so sad to say, like man, it felt like a a breath of fresh air to see a quarterback go behind the line and continuously, frequently change in and out of plays based on what the defense was giving him. Um, yeah, it just feels weird. It just felt so weird to be so excited about having a quarterback that can do that. But with the incoming Tom Brady, twenty year vet 
who's seen every defense that you can imagine. At least that's what he says, and that's how a lot of people feel. This cat can come in and he can he can do some he can do some stuff that obviously has never been done in Tampa, which for better or worse is just gonna be it's just gonna be such a celebratory feeling like every time he gets behind center. Every time he gets under center he's gonna be like that's something I've not seen before or that's something that's magical. It's it's really gonna be about him and his presence. And what he can bring, and he brings a hell of a whole lot that's not been in Tampa. Um, you mentioned his. Um, you kind of mentioned some of his tendencies from last season as well, and his uh, depth of uh, his depth of targets and so forth. With weapons like Ronald Jones coming out of the backfield, Mike Evans on the outside, Chris Godwin on the outside, and sometimes in the slot. Rob Gronkowski, O.J. Howard, and with the Bucks playing and 12 personnel with two tight ends, do you foresee his targets being more so letting the guys on the outside as well as the tight ends kind of clear everything out for Ronald Jones? Do we see like a bigger uptick in Ronald Jones's receptions and yards in that category being a stronger weapon for Tom Brady? How do you see him being used? Well, we know that he's he's made a great use of of his running backs in in New England. You know, it, it's um, I just don't see right now a running back on this roster um, that you can you can trust uh, in passing situations. Uh, the one that they had, they've they've let go uh, in, in Dari Ogun Oh no, no, I just um, oh man, no. So. <laughs> You know, uh, yes, Leonard Fournette saw 100 targets and caught, I think it was 76 last season, but he wasn't, he didn't do a whole lot with them. You know, it's not as though the, the Jaguars were, were designing their offense around passes to Leonard Fournette. You know, the, that was, that, those were, were check down type passes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and we've seen, um, you know, Ronald Jones has never really been a natural uh, pass catcher going going back to his days at, at USC. Um, so, and 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 Vaughn, Keishon Vaughn is a is a is is a rookie, uh, and so I just don't see um, that type of back on on this roster at this time, uh, and it's it, it's even harder to to make that. Um, make that proclamation, you know, given that we haven't seen any, any preseason games. Mm. So, you know, I, you know, that, that's one of the things, Robert, that I'm just really curious about how, how Tom Brady uh, works, um, you know, uh, works his, his running backs into the uh, receiving game. See, um, see I actually have, um, see, I see, I feel like I've seen enough out of Leonard Fournette uh, based on his, Previous years, last year was kind of iffy up and down, what have you. But his previous years, as well as his collegiate career, I never saw him having an issue being a pass catcher. He seemed like he was a he seemed like he'd always been a pretty good pass catcher for me, uh, as far as, as as a running back. Like I've never, I never seen him as a liability in the passing game. Um, I've seen him catch it and go catch it and literally have power at the catch and break tackles and be able to do things with it. Um, I didn't do a deep enough dive into all of last season to see um, to see what was the cause for his uh, for his statistical output um, in the passing game last year. But just based on what I had seen on him in the few years that he played at LSU and his early uh, in his rookie season or what have you, uh, I'm sorry, his rookie and his second season, I felt like yeah, like he he was he was good in the passing game. Like he was he was one of those guys that you didn't have to take off the field for that. Um, and for Ronald Jones, gosh, man, Ronald Jones had some good catches and some runs last year as well. It was just the it was the opportunity for me. It felt like it was just the opportunity. He would uh, he would be open in the flat. He'd be open with you know the linebacker on him. He just didn't get the ball. We, I didn't feel like I saw enough opportunities with him getting uh, passes to actually show what he could do, or at least for people to appreciate what he can do. Um, I mean, hopefully. You know, with Tom Brady or any other quarterback other than what was here last year, 
would be, you know, good enough, quick enough, smart enough to get the balls out to whatever running back is on the field when you got guys who can spray the field out like the wide receivers that are on this team. Yeah, you know, I was really curious when, when the Bucks signed Tom Brady and everything we've heard about this offseason about Ronald Jones. I was really curious to see how that um, how that relationship would, would, would develop. Um, and, and we may not kind of get to see that to the scale that, that I thought we were going to. Um, you know, to me, Leonard Fournette is, is not a significant upgrade over Ronald Jones. Um, but, um, you know, to your, to your point, um, you know, I think, I think one edge that, that Fournette may provide over, uh, over Ronald Jones, he's not a great pass blocker. Um, but, but he, he may be good enough as a pass catcher, um, where, where, where he's not a total liability. Like he's, he's pretty good at protecting the football. He doesn't fumble all that often. Um, so and that's and that's one thing that the Saints have done. Well, one of many things that the Saints have done through the years is they've been really good at protecting the football, mm. and obviously the Bucks have not. Ooh, um, no. So, so, <laughs> so when you're looking and and like those are the, those are little things, you know, kind of kind of on the on the on the margins that, um, you know, that that are the difference between you know good teams and bad teams. So. You know, uh, you know. Okay, so Al, uh, you know Leonard Fournette might not be Christian McCaffrey, right? Right. But you know, if he's not turning the ball over, um, and you know, and 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 the Bucks have a big lead, it, it, it's not going to matter how efficient or inefficient he is. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, yeah, uh, you know, just to 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 add to your your point, um, you know, if he's if he's serviceable in in the past game. Um, and he doesn't doesn't and he protects the football. Um, you know the, the the Bucks will be in decent shape there. I just I just don't see him being worth the the two million. I, I just don't see him being two million dollars worth of an upgrade over Ronald Jones. That's a uh, and, and that's I think that's a valid point. Uh, just for me as a from a team building perspective, uh, which is which is. Uh, Something I've looked at for the past few years. I've I've had issues with how this team was being built, and I've kind of been on Jason Light's head for you know not having a plan, just kind of going, uh, just kind of going with the flow, which was it's just super weird to me for a GM. Um, like there's not been a plan or what have you. So to have to so to bring in a Leonard Fournette while you have Ronald Jones on the roster, who was in his third year. Basically, the make or break year for pretty much every young star, like your third year, is where you have to kind of make a you have to make a name for yourself. You have to do something to to stand out. For him to have for them to have Leonard Fournette on a one year contract, and then have Ronald Jones on the roster at the same time, like you you want to you want to validate one of those two, and it's not like you and it's really a lot of things have to go well for you to validate. Both of them, and then you throw in a third round running back and Keyshawn Vaughn, and it's like <sighs> the value of one of those three guys, if not two of those guys, is going to go down significantly. And it's just and it, it feel like it is it, it's, it's a weird build. It's a weird build, but that's a that's another story on another on another episode of a podcast because that's going to be. I'm just going to go the hell off talking about, about that. I've, I think I've done it before at one point, but the building of the roster is kind of curious again. But when you look at, that's why I felt like it felt like a video game. When you look at all the talent that is on this roster, all the potential that is on this roster, it feels like a dream because it's something that probably shouldn't happen. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't have this much talent. As dumb as that sound, as dumb as that may sound, unless there's a, unless there's a plan, unless there's a, Unless the stars line up and you actually have a plan, which the Bucks have not over the last six years, including the five years that Jason Light has had control of the final roster, it just it has to be put together well. Acquiring talent and actually utilizing talent in a in a in a good way are completely and vastly different. 
It's not like collegiate football where you can just get, you know, four and five star players and put them on a the field because your roster is so big, you can just rotate them in and out and they can all make a name for themselves in some way, somehow. That's not the way it works in the NFL. I've never I've never seen it really work that way. But again, that's a different different story. I want to get back to Tom Brady and um and the matchup with him from the quarterback side of Drew Brees. Um was there anything that you saw we talked about the decline of or the the lack of a decline from Drew Brees. Was there anything that you saw in your numbers from last year that's a concern for for Tom Brady? Yeah, you know, there there are some red flags here and um nobody's nobody's really going to want to confront it because he's he's the GOAT, right? Uh you know, six Super Bowls, three MVPs, if I'm not mistaken. Three MVPs, yep. Um, but you know, and and yes, you know, uh his his weak supporting cast, it's a valid point. Mm-hmm. But consider Last season, he posted his lowest touchdown total since 2006, his lowest touchdown rate of his career, his lowest completion percentage since 2013, his lowest yards per attempt since 2002, his lowest yards per completion since 2008, his lowest passer rating since 2013. Um, And by Football Outsiders uh, efficiency metrics, uh, DVOA, he posted his lowest uh, passing uh, DVOA of his career. So there are some red flags here, you know, and, and it's difficult to separate, you know, uh, quarterback from receiver. Um, but, uh, you know, all of these, you know, Brady's had some, some weak supporting casts before and, and hasn't, hasn't, his performance hasn't quite dipped like it has these past couple of seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then also what, what stood out to me um, now, this is, this is somewhat conditional because uh, full season performance is more predictive uh, than, than half season performance. Um, there's a, there's a caveat here, which is that, you know, we're, we're an uncharted territory with Tom Brady, 43 year old quarterback. And we're, 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 we're picking apart his performances from the past couple of seasons, looking for signs of decline. Mm -hmm. Um, So again, given that, you know, he's, he's a 43 year old quarterback. We we've never seen somebody perform at this level, this, this late into his career. Um, You know, we, and, and we know that p- quarterback performance can decline suddenly. What stands out to me last year is that uh, from the first half of the season to the second half of the season, uh, he fell from an above average quarterback to a below average quarterback. Um, and what metrics? So and what metrics was was that? Using, is that a football, using football outsiders um, metrics. Uh, uh, Defense adjusted value over average. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I don't know. I don't know that he's had. Um, I'm, I'm looking over his numbers now. I, I don't know that he's had that quite quite that kind of a drop off in in, in his in, in at least the past ten years. So is this is this uh, just um, you know football randomness? It could be. Mm-hmm. Uh, or is this the the you know the signs of a of a quarterback that's 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 breaking down late in late in the season? That could be too. I I, I don't really know. As I said, you know, full season performance tends to be more predictive than half season performance. But you know, in in, in Brady's case, this this could go either way. Okay, I think he's he's probably got another really good season in him. Mm-hmm. Um, but there 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 is. Um, you know, I think a, a not insignificant percentage chance that that you know this deteriorates late in the season. Did you? Uh, quick question. This is almost this is it's almost a random question in that world. Uh, when you look at his decline, uh, was there another way to look at another quarterback's decline? Like I say, um, let's say 
Peyton Manning, which was a pretty sharp decline after his injury. Um, and I'm trying to think who else. Uh, but I think Peyton Manning would probably be the 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 only decline I can think of um, that I was would actually try to measure up to. But his was obviously because of his, well, not just his age, but also that injury to his neck. Um, I was just trying to see if there was a way to compare the two. I guess I have to probably do that offline as well and come back and take a look at it. But that's that's what I was. I was that's what I would be very interested in is his decline versus another player's decline at that age. Um, and I think I w- I would put Brett Favre in that category as well to kind of to kind of get a compare and contrast to see to see if there's any kind of um, correlation in in the decline and how quickly it actually comes. Well, you know that that's funny because I did some I did some research on on uh, Drew Brees. So yeah. you know how I was saying a second ago that that full season performance is more predictive, and Drew Brees had um, kind of a, a late season uh, swoon in 2018, and, and and some people were were warning that uh, oh this is this is like Peyton Manning's late 2014 swoon and and so this is this is a signal that 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 breeze is on the verge of 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 decline um and it turns out um that 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 breeze bounced back right um so you know i i think i think the takeaway in general is that what happens in, in december doesn't doesn't necessarily carry over to to January, let alone September, Brett, uh, you know, Brett Favre, um, going back to, to his, uh, second to last season, um, he showed, uh, no signs of decline. Uh, same for okay. Carson Palmer. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you know, when, when we predict a quarterback's decline, I, I mean, if we if we keep saying it enough, eventually, eventually <laughs> we're going to be right. Right. Hey, progress over predictions all the damn time for me. Uh, but that's how it goes. People predict people uh, players going down, but like when they had a bad a bad year last year or a bad performance last year. Uh, I think you and I are both on the same wave when we talk about uh, OJ Howard. Uh, a lot of people wanted to write him off as if he didn't have two damn near phenomenal first season before switching into an offense where he was an additional right tackle for basically his old damn existence last year. And everybody wrote him off as if, or started to write him off as if he wasn't who he was. Like, yeah, he he's off. Like, he fell off. Like, no, he just had a, had a bad season. Had a lot of stuff that was going on, a lot of variables into his play, which caused the results that he saw. So... Yeah, but yeah, you, you, you're right. A lot of people want to predict, and you know, if you keep predicting it, predicting it enough, then yeah, you you eventually be right. And right, and that's why I, I you know I kind of characterize it as I do is like yeah, you know, I, I think I think uh, you know I understand why why the Bucks uh, were were interested in Tom Brady. Obviously, two years I think was was going a bit far. Um, you know, given that that. I mean, we just we just have no idea how a quarterback's going to perform at age forty three, at age forty four. Yeah. Um, you know, all signs. You know, uh, well, there's there's, I think a lot of signs point to Tom Brady still being uh, an effective quarterback. Maybe maybe uh, expecting I think him him to perform at the the level he has in the re in 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 the re- in recent history is a lot. Um, you know, he might not be the kind of guy that can can carry a team, but with this roster, he shouldn't have to. And this is this is a good enough offensive line. Um, you know, I think Donovan Smith had a had a sneaky good season last year in, in pass protection. You know, Ali, Ali Marpet and and um, Ryan Jensen are are top notch uh, offensive linemen at their positions. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got a, pro- a promising ro- uh, rookie in, in Tristan Wirfs. So, um, you know, and, and then, of course, there's there's the receivers, you know, Mike Evans and, and, and Chris Godwin and uh, Gronkowski and 
um, O.J. Howard. You know, the, you know, to, to expound, expand on your point about O.J. Howard, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still high on O.J. Howard, and I'm buying O.J. Howard stock. You know, Rob, Gr- Gr- Rob Gronkowski, um, you know, he, he was in retirement last season, and he, and, he, and he did that in part because it was another back surgery or retirement. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many games we're going to get out of Rob Gronkowski, and I don't know how effective he'll be in those games. Maybe it'll just be like it was when, when they were in New England. But I, I think I think it's it's dangerous to to, to count on that. Um, so um, you know to have uh, OJ Howard second on that on that depth chart. I, that's the one position on this team that that I'm I'm really not concerned about at all. You know that I think that's that's maybe the deepest position uh, on the roster is is tight end. Rob Gronkowski, um, OJ Howard, and then Cam Brate. Yeah. And I believe Anthony, uh, uh, Anthony, uh, Claire, he's also, yep. he's also, he's one of my, uh, he's actually one of my favorite, favorite guys. He's a, he's a solid catcher. He gets a lot of, uh, he gets a lot of notoriety for being a blocker, basically that same role that OJ Howard was forced into and, you know, just being an additional right tackle, but our uh, Claire can catch and, uh, he's got some athleticism to him and I like him a lot, a great deal actually. Yeah, and, and when you think about it, you know, I said maybe probably the the deepest position on the roster. Even, you know, we, we think the Bucks are set at receiver with Mike Evans and Chris Godwin. But, I mean, if, if either one of those two miss significant time, I mean, they're suddenly very thin there, right? Absolutely. And as, and my uh, it's been my saying for years, until, you, until your wide receivers can all vie for the number two spot, you need to continue building. Granted, I absolutely love uh, Justin Watson. Love Justin Watson. Um, I like what Tyler Johnson could be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Scotty Miller has a lot of talk behind him, but I, I, I can I can say it and I will. Scotty Miller, as much as I like him, as much as I hope he can be a good player. He quite literally is getting a hell of a whole lot of attention because he's a short white dude that reminds people of Wes Welker, Edelman, and the you know whatever sticker or whatever name you can think of that came out of New England. That's literally why he gets so much attention. However, the dude has potential. He's he's fast. He's got talent. He's got all this stuff. But people are speaking, uh, talking him up as if he could be in the place of a Chris Godwin. He can't. That Chris. That um. That that Wes Welker Elderman player, that's that's Chris Godwin. Chris Godwin is that slot guy. Chris Godwin is that tough dude who will take a shot over the middle. Chris Godwin is that guy who can catch a short one and take it to the house every damn time. Like that's that's his spot. Um, Scotty Miller. I don't know if Scotty Miller is going to be big enough, strong enough to play in the slot and be, and be a really strong guy. Um, I'd be very, very welcome to see it. I'd be happy to see him do that. And, um, and surprise me again, he has, he has talent. He can, he can play, but he's going to have to, he's going to have to show a whole hell of a lot of toughness to validate that, you know, that role that everybody's trying to place him in as if he's, you know, again, the West Welkers and the and the elements of the world. That's that's a hell of a whole lot for him to live up to, and it's unjust that he has to, or it's unjust that people want to throw that at him. But again, it's literally because of because of his appearance it has nothing to do with what they've seen on film because it's it's not there yet, at least not in Tampa Bay. That's one of the best points I've heard about the Bucks uh, all off season. You know, the the talk about. You know who's going to be the West Welker, the Julian Edelman. This team, this team has already had it, and and his name is Chris Godwin. Uh, he he does so much uh, on, on this offense from from the outside, in, from the slot, as a as a blocker. Um, he he really is the most versatile receiver uh, on this on this offense, and and maybe uh, with with all due respect to to Mike Evans, maybe the best all around receiver on this football team yeah he i would say he is I, I i i honestly would say he is and i've watched him since penn state and i was i was a penn, uh, 
apologize. I was a fan of his at Penn State, uh, both him and Hamilton. I'm still waiting to see what happens, what comes out of him. Hamilton was actually the uh, he was actually was the number one wide receiver, if I'm not mistaken, while they were at Penn State. But um, yeah, man, Chris Godwin is is just a hell of a player. He's just a tough, tough dude with a whole lot of talent and a whole lot of heart. Um, he, he he can he can do it all. I don't think I actually I'm not on board with you know the you know he he can take Mike Evans spot as a wide receiver one just because Mike 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 has to be double teamed mm-hmm. for the most part. Mike Mike Evans is an absolute mismatch, physical mismatch above everything else. Chris Godwin can run all the routes. Chris Godwin can fight off tackles. Chris Godwin, however, I don't think is a mandatory double team. Not with a you know, with a good quarterback. With a good quarterback, Mike Evans is it's going. I think he's going to be a damn near mandatory double team. You can't do a damn thing about him. I, I'm not kidding when I tell you. Do not be surprised if when you see Mike Evans doing Randy Moss type things on the field with a quarterback that can actually get him the ball in space when he's a, when he's got two or three steps in front. Of a cornerback I would not be surprised I, I tell people now Do not be surprised If you see him Straight up Mossing folks And I've never used that term A day in my life Until tonight But They're gonna have to rena- They may have to rename that But Mike Evans Can burn people And he's big enough To just Bully the hell out of them And I expect to see that With a quarterback That can actually put the ball Where he can get it Routinely and have it not be a damn surprise. Like that's, I, I feel like that can happen. I'm not predicting it. I'm not telling you that's something that's guaranteed. But I'm telling you, do not be surprised to see Mike Evans highlight real catches, burns every other week. I just feel like I, I just feel like I've seen enough from him. I've seen enough misses. I've seen enough incompletions of him with two or three steps on good cornerbacks. And he don't get the ball where he can do something with it. We make a lot of noise about his catching the ball and not be able to get yards after the catch. That may change once he starts getting those long balls or those uh, balls just, again, in areas where the defense can't get it and he can do something with it. Todd Bowles, greatest compliment he felt like he can give Tom Brady, after he got pissed, I don't think he got pissed, but I think he got tired of hearing you know questions about Tom Brady. But he said the best compliment I can give is that he throws great incompletions. Mm. He puts the ball where no defense, or he puts the ball where defenses routinely have a hard time trying to get that ball. That hasn't been the case for Mike Evans since he's been in the NFL. This year could could be that case for him. No, that's it's, it's funny how maybe how little we've talked about Mike Evans this this off season, and he really is having. Uh, you you brought up Randy Moss, a Randy Moss like career. Uh, he's really on that track, um, and maybe um, you know with uh, you know the the added national attention this year, um, maybe maybe some other people who, who might not be familiar with his track record will, will finally take notice of the uh, terrific career that he's, uh, he's had. And uh, one of the things I've always liked about Mike, I mean, he's, he's obviously, you know, a big physical receiver, but um, he's, he's as, as competitive as it gets. And he, yeah. he really wants to be an all time great. He's not satisfied. Uh, trust me. He's not satisfied. Um, so, um, you know, he, he wants to be one of the best of all time. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to, to see, uh, what, what happens for him this season. No, and I, I wholeheartedly agree, man. He's, uh, he's, he's actually already one of my favorite bugs of all time. And I can hold, I, and I can tell you, I did not, I wasn't pounding the table for him either as a draft pick. Um, that draft, I wanted what I still want. I wanted a defensive tackle to be next, to be lined up next to another good defensive tackle in Tampa Bay. I wanted Aaron Donald at that pick. I pounded. I talked about it forever. I'm still talking about that forever. I I just wanted to see two potentially dominant 
defensive tackles, defensive players on the line in Tampa. But Mike Evans has gone above and beyond in being one of the best players in any position in Tampa. He's done nothing but get better. He's 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 improved on every single thing that was an issue with him coming out of college. I thought he was one of those guys. Well, in fact, he was one of those guys who relied a hell of a whole lot on just his physical talent, his height, his size, and just being bigger, stronger than his defenders. This cat can run routes. This cat can catch it with his hands away from his body. This dude does it all. He, he He's just been – he's on and off the field, he's been exactly what you want a franchise player to be for your team. And I, uh, I, I absolutely love that cat. Absolutely love him. Well, you know, going back to, to early in his career, you know, 2000 um, – uh, 2000. 14, 15, 16, 17. I mean, a lot of his production was tied to volume. Yeah. Um, you know, but but go back to 2017, 14.1 yards per catch. Each of the past two seasons, he's been well over 17 yards per catch. So you're seeing him, uh, I mean, he's he's seeing a lot of targets, yes, but you're seeing him do more with the football mm-hmm. even than, than he had been. You know, and, you know, five five touchdown catches, 2017, eight touchdown catches in each of the past two seasons. So I mean, it's I, I, I it's it's hard for me to not to see, barring injury, of course, hard for me to not see him getting his seventh straight 1,000 yard receiving season and maybe another eight touchdowns. Yeah, it all starts in Week One when he's going to be matched up against Marshawn Lattimore, who, um, damn it, who basically had a hell of a season with him, or uh, well, at least he had a hell of a two games against him last year. Uh, a lot of that didn't have a damn thing to do with with Mike Evans, though. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's going to be a different story this year. And again, it all starts next week against the Saints. Um, it, it's it's going to be amazing. It, it's going to be a good thing. I've never used the word amazing so many times in my life. Um, but I want to get. I, want, I do want to kind of revisit real quick before I move on to um, to what I believe is going to be the biggest the biggest uh, thing for me that I'm going to be watching out for next week. Um, so Tom Brady and Drew Brees, again, three and two in the matchup with the favor going to Drew Brees. Um, which one do you think, which of those two quarterbacks you think has more to, uh, not more to prove, but has more to offer against the opposing defenses? Like the defenses we know with the, uh, in Tampa, we got the young uh, core of cornerbacks, the entire secondary. Um, what the Tampa Bay Buccaneers can do against Drew Brees because he's a sh- because he's a shorter quarterback is kind of rush him up the middle, which is kind of always been like the talk for him. If you can get push up the middle, he can't see. He has to scramble out of the pocket. He has to do all kinds of things just to get the ball out if they're not a quick pass, which he's been good at. Uh, do you foresee him being able to pull that off with the uh, with the with the defensive talent that the Bucks have coming back this season. He only played against them last season once. Um, and his his competition on the side of the field was, you know, they, he helped them out a whole lot. They gave away – we gave the ball away four times based on, on just interceptions last year and on that game there against, um, against Breeze. But do you see Breeze having a decent time or, have, or at least being able to – to get the ball out as fast as he's done so in the past with this this newer defense? Well, you know, we – so going back to what was it, week 11 last year, that was the game Drew Brees played against the the Bucks. I think that was – That was, was week that 11, yep. 31-17, was that the final score? Yep, 34-17. 34-17, yeah. yeah. So um, – you know, I, I was I was going back and, and looking at that game a little bit. So one thing about that game is there was no Jamel Dean. Uh, right. He started started the next week. So so maybe um, you know maybe that's um, maybe that's a factor in the in the Bucks' favor come come week one this this time around. We have Davis and, and Dean on the outside and Murphy Bunting. As uh, on on the um, on the inside, um, you know, I remember in that game, um, 
Murphy Bunting struggled in, in coverage, mm. um, uh, particularly against Michael Thomas. Uh, I, I believe with in, in Murphy Bunting's coverage, Breeze targeted Thomas four times, and he uh, Thomas caught all four passes for either a touchdown or a first down. Um, something else to watch, though, you know, because Thomas does so much work. We think of him as, you know, you sometimes think of a number one receiver as a guy who's working the sidelines, right? But yeah, he's a slot guy as well. Obviously, it just just can kill you wherever. And and um, one play in particular um, that that I remember was, um, you know, the Bucks were still hanging around. This is third quarter. And it's it's twenty to ten. You know the Saints have a ten point lead. The Bucks get them to like think it's it's third and short. It might might have been third and three. And uh, Thomas runs a, a crosser over the middle, and Breeze backpedals a little bit, waits, 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 and as soon as Thomas clears um, behind the middle linebacker Devin White. Uh, you know, hits hits Thomas in stride, and and it catches Devin White flat footed, and Thomas goes up the sideline for a forty one yard gain, I think it was, and then Saints went on, I think, to score a touchdown, and that really was that really was the dagger. So I, I think one of the you know I you know absolutely I think I think Breeze Breeze can carve up this this defense again. Uh, this could be another shootout like it was in Week One in two thousand eighteen. Um, you know, these guys could be airing it out. I think. I think the key um, to me is is um, you know beyond the secondary. I think. I think the the secondary holding up is is an obvious key. But how Devin White um, plays in coverage, mm-hmm. uh, he, you know, the Bree, Breeze just picked on him last time, and and he was a rookie. Um, but I think he was talking uh, eleven times, and 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 the saints caught all 11 passes. So that on the, on the, I, you know, uh, on the, on the buck side, I think that's uh, an X factor is, is, is Devin white and, and, and his progression. Um, it'd be good to see, you know, after, after he struggled against the saints the last time out, take a step forward uh, this time and, and, and hold his own, you know, linebackers of, of course are always vulnerable to, to those those short passes. Yeah. Uh, so the, the completion percentage is always going to be high. But the fact that Breeze went after him, um, you know, eleven times, Tw- I, think, uh, I think is I think is telling. Yeah. Th- uh, so. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I apologize. But yeah, I had uh, twelve for twelve for ninety six yards. Uh, no okay. touchdowns on them. But again, once you you get somebody to twelve for twelve, then you might as well you you're definitely getting picked on. You're getting Getting your ass whooped, but yeah, twelve for twelve. Breeze was for ninety six yards against Devin White on uh, on all his targets. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, you know that you know number you know and then an early first round pick. Um, you know lots of lots of promise around Devin White. To, you know what better time to to show up than 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 week one against a division rival and, and the Saints. You know if if again you know if they can. Um, if they can kind of limit those um, Michael Thomas and those explosive plays, um, you know, you know, Saints won't run won't run away with the game this time. Um, so, going ahead on my last thing, uh, not my last thing, but yeah, pretty much my last thing I want to talk about. I think the biggest factor is something that I'm going to be looking at outside of the two quarterbacks, um, the coaches, the coaches. I'm going to the coach is going to be a big focal point for me. Um, again, Sean Payton has had a hell of a good time against the Bucks. It feels like since his uh, since his uh, since he's come to town in New Orleans. Um, this is Bruce Arians' second year in the NFC South, um, and I had mixed. I had terribly mixed feelings about him and his presence and what he was doing last year. Um, based on what you've seen on between the two coaches last year, were there any kind of tendencies that stood out to you from Peyton uh, that contrasted what Bruce Arians did with his offense? 
Well, I, you know, I think, I think one of the, one of the, one of the things that, that, that might not necessarily show up, um, you know, on the stat sheet or even when you're watching the games, you know, but, but you, you kind of notice over time is, you know, so, you know, Breeze and Peyton have been together since, um, since 2006, I think, you know, and, and this is the first year of Arians and, and Tom Brady, you know, they, they both, um, Peyton and Arians run, you know, broadly versions of the air Coriel offense, you know, obviously though, you know, the, the saints run a much different, uh, you know, version, you know, they're, they're running shorter routes. They're more horizontal than, than the, the bucks, you know, and then part of that is Bruce Arians instructions, you know, um, you know, Brady, I think said it at, at some point this off season, you know, like, I mean, it seems simple, but like, Football is like you, you see an open guy, you you throw it, you you throw it to the open guy, and that's you know that's 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 his philosophy. That's not Arians' philosophy. Mm. He wants you to go for the the killer plays, the chunk plays, and you know, um, you know, I, I think when you when you watch the Saints, you see they're they're uh, uh, an offense that will just take what you you know will will manipulate the defense at the line of scrimmage and will take what the defense gives them. I expect to see a little bit more of that from the Bucks this season than we have in the past. But I think I think what what I come away from from watching the Saints and and just is is what's remarkable to me is, and, and the advantage that they have is their continuity. Like I said, Breeze and Payton since 2006. There's also Pete Carmichael. Their offensive coordinator has been there for a long time. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it, it kind of, you know, I, I, I think of it like when you're playing board game, uh, a board game with family members and, you know, you're, you're playing, um, you know, you're, you're, you you you're playing with like your 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 brother or your sister on a team like you know there's there's a and you know you guys have a code an unspoken language that 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 you guys understand you know it, you know um and and you know Arians and Brady uh are are still kind of developing and, and Leftwich you know are are still developing that, that relationship you know like that 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 kind of just in you know in, uh, in that the intuitive language, you know? Um, so, you know, that's, yeah, again, that's not necessarily that something that shows up in the, in the stat sheet or, or, you know, on, on the game film, but, but when you watch the Saint, Saints over the years, I mean, that's, that's something that's, that's really remarkable to me is, 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 is um, the, the kind of built in advantage that you have when you've kind of got a group like that, that has been together for, you know, more than a decade, 14, 15 seasons. Mm. Yeah. And, and uh, just revisiting your point about Arians and his love for the deep ball and chunk plays and stuff like that. It's so hard, man. It is so damn hard to catch a beat on Bruce Arians because he says one thing and then he'll say something else to completely contradict that or he'll do one thing and then he says something that contradicts um, what he does and or what he says. Uh, I remember in his in his first few interviews or press conferences with the Bucks last year, he uh, someone made mention of his you know taking chunk plays and how well it would play into the uh, into the into the world of the former starting quarterback. And how he liked to throw chalk plays and big plays and so forth. And Bruce Arians made a point to say that, like, people love to think that I like to dial up big plays. He was like, that was all Carson Palmer in Arizona. He was like, he threw, the, he was the one throwing the ball. There were, you know, there were routes underneath such and such, like the decision to throw the ball deep. That wasn't me every play. Um, and people who have studied, or who have watched a lot of Bruce Arians' uh, offense, uh, be it in Pittsburgh, Cleveland, or Arizona, like they all make that make that connection that he just dial, he dials up a whole lot of deep uh, deep plays, long developing routes, so forth. 
and everything. And then it just made me think, like, yeah, that's that's basically like a lateral move from Dirk Cutter. Everything that Dirk Cutter got blamed for, everything that Dirk Cutter was shunned for, was present in Bruce Arians. Everything. Every single thing. Loan development plays. Uh, throwing chunk, you know, big plays all the time, going for big yards, not having underneath routes, which is, you know, absolutely false. But all of those things just came to pass as, you know, Bruce Arians doing the exact same thing as the previous coach. But I, I just, it's hard, it's just so hard to catch a beat on him, man. He, I, I don't know what his plan is. Well, I mean, I, I don't think he, I don't think he wants you to, right? I mean, like, that's um, that's one of the things, right? As, as somebody who follows the team, right, and well, and you and you follow the team as well. I mean, it, for for all of us, it's it, it's it's one of the things that that, that can be uh, kind of entertaining about uh, about Arians and, and and frustrating at the same time. I mean, uh, his his job isn't right. His job isn't to be honest with us. Uh, you know, his his job's um, to. Uh, yeah, he might he might think his job is to is is to confuse us sometimes, and it's it's amusing to me that that you 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 brought up the the point about Carson Palmer and him putting that on on, on Carson. I mean, that's just so, that's such. I mean, I, I won't call it a lie, but it, I mean that's 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 totally misleading. That's that's baloney. I mean, I, there's a there's a quote that I've I've brought up uh, a couple of times from. Arians' book, The Quarterback Whisperer, and, and, it's, and it's this. Uh, he said, I constantly told Andrew, Andrew Luck, to take a shot if the defense appeared vulnerable based on its pre-snap formation. If it's third and three and you got T.Y. T.Y. Hilton uh, on a deep route, then throw the effing ball to T.Y. <laughs> I tell Andrew, I don't care that we only need three yards. Throw the ball to T.Y. <laughs> so... Uh, that 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 is Bruce Arians. Uh, he he doesn't care whether whether you just need three yards. He wants you to go for the kill. That's just ridiculous. It, it kills me. Like it, it it just kills me so bad. I'm like man, and I love to hear him talk. I won't even lie. I I think there's something wrong with me because I absolutely love to hear him talk. But I know good and damn well I don't trust. <laughs> I don't trust half of what he says. It's entertaining as hell. He's a hell of a quote machine, um, and you know I have no reason to think he's not a decent person, a good guy, and a, or a good coach or what have you. I, I don't know that. I'm gonna find that out this year, though. I will find out starting week one against the Saints. But I don't know how good of a coach he is. All I know how good he is at entertaining the hell out of me. And um, and I, again, I brought up the 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 comparison with him and Dirk Cutter. Um, obviously, you mentioned the quarterback whisper moniker, which was you know basically the title of a book that he agreed to to name it. Someone else came up with it, but you know people started running with it. Uh, I have my issues with that. Obviously, I honestly don't think that he's a quarterback whisperer. There's nothing in his history that if you if you took a just a half look at it that would validate that whole quarterback whisper thing. But again, I want I want to play for you right now. I want to play for you, to the listeners, the last press conference that the head coach before Bruce Arians came into town. I'll play a clip for you of how his press conference ended in his last year. Then I'll play again Bruce Arians' last press conference of the year last year. This is Dirk Cutter, his last press conference. Um in Tampa when we all knew that he was going to get fired. And it's all because of the same reason. And, and this, this is what happened. One second. Dirk, when you look back on this season, just uh, in 5-11 and 11, with the talents here, what, what do you think were the, were the main problems? This Not year? even close turnovers. I mean, uh, you know, the turnover margin to be whatever, we, minus 16, minus 18, whatever we were, it was even today. But, you know, we just dug ourselves a hole way too many times in the turnover margin. And That was Dirk Cutter. Dirk Cutter got fired. Exact same, same reason, 
This is the exact same reason why there was a losing season in 2018. Is the exact same reason there was a losing season in 2019. Last season, Bruce Arians' first year. Uh, Bruce Arians talked up his quarterback at the time all year, all offseason. Um, this is how the final press conference of the 2019 season ended for Bruce Arians. Can you get past leading the league in giveaways? Can you get past that? No, because you're not going anywhere. You're going home. You're going home when you lead the league in giveaways. You're never going to play in the playoffs unless you're playing for Steelers in the 70s. So Bruce Arians, when I, when I look at these lateral moves and I, and I talk about Bruce Arians and how good he may or may not be as a head coach, I, I look at stuff like that. Bruce Arians, Bruce Arians had a uh, – he had such an up and down season last year, more down than up. I won't even bullshit you. Anybody who's listening, I'm a again, I'm a Bucks fan, 100. percent I'm not, I'm not falling into the foolishness though. Uh, it was way more down than up. Bruce Arians made a whole lot of crazy talks. He had made a whole lot of crazy quotes. He did a whole lot of dumb stuff. I thought as a head coach, I did. He did some things I didn't think that you should be doing as a head coach. Um, again, he may be a good coach. He 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 has a hell of a whole a hell of a roster now, but he made some mistakes last year that were ri- ridiculous. Some mistakes that cost a game or two, ridiculous things. So when I look at the matchup between Sean Payton and Bruce Arians, these are the kind of things I come up with. Uh, another reason why I question Bruce Arians. And his mindset and why it always confuses me as to how good of a coach he is and how how strong of an area is that for the Bucks Outside of the roster, what else do the Bucks have going? Because it's going to be a whole lot that determines this season. And part of it is going to be the coach, the coaching, as well as the mental, um, the mental health of the team. We don't have a bye week until week 12. Do we have the kind of coach who can motivate a roster with this much talent? Can handle these this many personalities? All these guys who are on one year contracts who are trying to boost their personal stats and their personal presence in the league to ensure that they can get a contract next year. Can he handle all of the stuff that comes with it? It takes a special kind of coach to manage these kind of this kind of mentality. It took a Phil Jackson to, to manage a, a Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen. It took a Bill Belichick to manage Tom Brady, Rob Gronkowski, and everybody else. And he treated all those guys, allegedly, he treated all of them the same, for better or worse. Bruce Arians is going to have to do the very best job he has ever had to do. He has never had this much pressure Never had these this many eyes. Sean Payton right now has the advantage over over Bruce Arians, and I hate it. Is there anything that you can think of a redeeming quality from Bruce Arians that make you think that just week one? We'll go into the rest of the season a little bit later, but week one. You think Bruce Arians can get this team ready in seven days to come out and become victorious against the Saints, against Sean Payton, against a 14-year relationship with his quarterback and his offense coordinator? You know, I think, you know, uh, Yes, uh, you know Bruce Bruce Arians, um, you know made made some mistakes last season. You know I, I think he made some decisions last year that that cost him a couple of football games. I'm thinking about the uh, the fourth down decisions uh, in the Giants game. Yeah, uh, yeah. and you I, I apologize. I interrupt you. This is exactly this is what you're talking about the the fourth down uh, decision. With the kicker, this this was his excuse for taking the penalty in that game. This is this is what he said in the press conference. Bruce, what happened at the end there when you got the five yard penalty? 
delay? What happened there? I just took it on purpose. You took it on purpose? Yeah, I want the field. He, he's better back. That field goal's easier back five yards. No, no sense hurrying. We wanted to move the ball over, put it in the middle, and uh, and make it an easy field goal. Coach had two. Kudos to whatever report it was that actually said, "What? <laughs> what you say? Say it again." And he was bold enough to say it again. That that did cause the game. I, I apologize. I had to interrupt you, but that was that was <laughs> that sh- that shit killed me and it pissed me off so bad. Continue. I apologize. Yeah, there was also a decision earlier in that game where I think they they chose to to punt on a on a fourth and one. You know, granted they were Giants territory, but you know you're you're likely to convert a fourth and one, um, and a fourth and one conversion there. You know, maybe maybe puts away the game, and you don't find yourself in in some of these other situations. Um, you know, but you know, I think I think the thing that Bruce Arians has. Um, has going for him is, you know, his, his staff believes in him, uh, and his players believe in him. Um, and I, I don't, I don't sense any kind of, um, you know, dissension, uh, you know, in that, in that, in that organization, you know, I think, I think we started to see some, some cracks, um, with, uh, Dirk Cutter and in, in his final season, you know, uh, the, um, you know, brought on by the Jameis Winston suspension, but you know the back and forth with the um, you know Ryan Fitzpatrick and Jameis Winston and his his management of the situation, um, yeah, which was really you know in, in to to cut in Cutter's defense an impossible situation, um, you know. But I, I don't I don't detect um, you know anything but uh, but um, you know belief in, in, in Bruce Arians and, and his, um, and, and, and his, his, his style, his system. Um, Mm. so, um, you know, I, I don't see, um, you know, I expect the bucks to be ready come, come week one. And I think it's, I think it's a good thing that, uh, remember when the schedule came out, there was a lot of, a lot of concern over, Oh, how, how dare the NFL hates us. You know, they're putting us in new Orleans week one. Uh, we, you know, we, you know, we'll, we'll have, we'll have no time to, to, to prepare. Um, you know, I think, I think this is a, a, a total, um, the fact that this is week one against the, against the saints, uh, in new Orleans where there's, there's, as as I understand it, no crowd. Um, uh, this this totally works in the in the Bucks' favor, you know. Plus, the Saints won't have any idea, just like the rest of us, what this Bucks offense is is going to look like. Uh, and and we have at least some idea what the what the Saints uh, Saints offense is going to look like. Uh, so you know, I you know I'm expecting a really competitive game. Um, but you know, I think I think Bruce Arians and his squad, you know, will 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 come out ready. And you know, it's it's not, um, you know, it's not as though uh, you know Bruce. It's it's all on Bruce Arians here either. Mm-hmm. You know, he's you know he's he's got um, he's got a good offensive coordinator, I think, in in Byron Leftwich, and 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 obviously, you know, I think. Uh, um, you know, almost a coach by default in, in, in Tom Brady. So, yeah. yeah, you know, they'll, 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 they'll come out, they'll come out ready and they'll, they'll be competitive. Damn sure. Hope so. I, I mean, I, I honestly believe that that'd be the case as well. Um, but again, it, I, it's just my nature to pull up anything that, that may or may not be a red flag, anything that it may or may not, uh, be 100%. And, uh, and I, I don't know. I'm just gonna be really, really interested to see how how Bruce Arians handles Week One in the pressure because he he obviously feels good, or at least again on the outside he looks like he feels good about what's happening outside of the kicker situation. Sweet Moses, um, <laughs> he he feel like he has a he has a good team and he's ready to and he's ready to roll. Um, so it, it's 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 just gonna be super. It's gonna be super fun, man. This time next week, Sunday, again, we'll be talking about how either the Bucks are going to the Super Bowl undefeated, 
or talking about how you know fire Jason Light hashtag weapons. It's a hashtag. It's a buck life. Uh, blame Jameis. All other kinds of bullshit. It's gonna be. It's gonna be. It's gonna be one extreme or, or another, man. And it, I'm. I'm so excited. I wish there were fans around. Actually, I don't wish there were fans in, in New Orleans. But I, I mean, uh, I do. I, it's gonna be weird. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of how the NBA has done such a terrific job with their. NBA bubble and their uh, fan situation. I'm just so curious to see how how the NFL handles the no fan situation for a lot of these stadiums. And New Orleans obviously is one of the toughest places for Bucks to play because that crowd is raucous and ridiculous every single game, no matter if they're winning or losing. But I'm so damn excited! So damn excited! Yeah, and if you're if you're really looking for something to to kind of um, uh, you know to to rein in the hype, you know the the one thing to watch this this season, you know, I, I'm expecting the offense is going to turn the ball over like it did last year. I can't. Uh, so so we'll so we'll see some improvement there. You know, uh, you know, I I, I don't know that I. I I'm not predicting like a top five offense, but, but if this, this offense can be, you know, um, middle of the, you know, average to, to just slightly above average, this should be a playoff caliber team. But the, the, you know, the one thing to, to watch for um, is uh, the defense and whether last season's improvement carries over to this season. Now there's something called the plexiglass principle, which is that when a defense significantly improves in one season the next season they're likely to backtrack a little bit Mm -hmm. um so you know we've 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 got uh um you know the bucks have a uh a relatively young um defense so so there's still room for growth so that's you know so so maybe we don't see um so maybe we don't see all that much regression but um, you know that 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 is that is something to watch for, especially you know I you know I think they're 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 pretty thin um, you know just about every, at, at every level there you know yes they've 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 got multiple defensive backs but you know if you if you lose a Carlton Davis for for any significant amount of time or or uh, Jamel Dean or, or Murphy Bunting I mean you're um, or or Levante David or Devin White, you know Shaq Barrett, you know you're you know the Dominican Sioux. I mean, be, beyond the front line, there's there's not a whole lot of depth on this team. So that's 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 something that concerns me. And if you're looking for a comp, there's the 2015 Jets, who uh, led by Todd Bowles, uh, had one of the largest turnarounds. Um, in, in, in the NFL, largest defensive turnarounds in the NFL, mm-hmm. and also had the number one rush defense that year. The 2016 Jets fell back quite a bit. Um, you know, in, in terms of uh, DVOA rankings, they fell from 6th to 23rd in 2016. The number one, they were still the number one run defense, so that might carry over, but their pass defense declined significantly. Now, part of that was you know, Darrell Revis was finished at that point. But the point being that defense can be really volatile from one season to the next. It's not as consistent as offense. Um, So if you're, if you're looking for one area, one area to kind of watch is, is that defensive uh, improvement and whether how much of it carries over um, to this, this coming season. I think chances are the offense gets, uh, a, a bit better should be average to just slightly above average at the least. Uh, you know, I don't know that this is going to be a top five defense again, mm. but if it's again, you know, but if it's, you know, top 10, this should be a, you know, a, a nine and seven, at least football team that, that, that should get in as, as a number six or number seven uh, seed. So um just, just one thing to you know. I know there's a lot of Super Bowl hype right now, but you know, I think 
Um, I think I think nine wins is is uh, nine and seven is is a is a real uh, is a realistic target. And just to say something on that too, man, at nine and seven, um, if you remember, nine and seven is exactly what the twenty sixteen bucks what they end up getting with uh, Dirk Cutter in his first year. That nine and seventeen was led by efforts from the defense more than anything all year. And also to follow up with the point of the defense not being able to repeat itself for one reason or another, if you remember that 2017 defense that followed that 2016-9-7 season, that team was hit by injuries unlike any other team that I can remember in Bucks history in at least the past 10 years. Every player on the uh, – every start I think missed at least two games. Uh, so that was one of the reasons why – while the uh, while the defense just went kaput, that's and, a that's a good point. Uh, that that also happened in 2018. They were hit hard again by injuries on defense. Right. And what happened in 2019? They were one of the more healthy defenses in the NFL. So yeah, exactly. Um, you know, if if they uh, that that turnaround in part down the stretch last year was was led by uh, a large number of turnovers. I think over the last from week 12 on. I think they had 13 takeaways, which were tied for second most. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, if, if and, and turnovers are one of those other things like health that can be really volatile from one season to the next. So, um, you know, yeah, there, there are some um, there are some warning signs here. You know, um, you know, as I as I wrote in the the uh, almanac, you know, the things that they have going for them is, you know, some some continuity in terms of, of coaching and players. There's been very little turnover on this defense. In fact, it might've gotten better with the drafting of Winfield, um, you know, and, and plus, you know, you're not, you're not going to have a defense that has to run back on the field constantly after interceptions. Yeah, that was tiresome. I swear to me, that was, that was the worst. The Bucks basically finished, uh, 32nd bottom of the league the last two seasons and over the last five seasons they were bottom five um, in turnover and giveaways while the defense was top 10 pretty much every year with the exception of 2000 and I believe 18 uh, and that was the one time that everybody actually noticed that the that the turnover ratio was lopsided prior to that nobody gave a damn that the defense was taking the ball away uh, basically top five, top ten, best in the league over the past few years. It didn't matter until 2018 when the Bucks basically had like a freaking minus 16 uh, turnover ratio, uh, turn away to giveaway, turnover to giveaway ratio. So, again, that was one of those things that people just didn't pay attention to uh, until it seemed to fit and to an excuse for them. Uh, hopefully that all changes this year and they kind of see the efforts that the defense has actually been putting over for the past few years, minus the injuries in 2017. Um, and if they don't have their back against the wall, they can actually show what they can do. That's kind of the hope for me going forward for the entire season. And again, it all starts next week, 425 kickoff, I believe, in the Crescent City against that team in New Orleans and that evil genius Sean Payton and his crew. Um, again, I'm super excited about about that game coming up. Um, we're about to get out of here, man. I've had you on uh, for a while. Again, I appreciate your time. I thank you uh, for sharing the knowledge that you did. Again, being a contributor to the pro football, I'm sorry, the uh, Football Outsiders Football Almanac Um you studied both teams. You 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 have a vast knowledge of, of what was going on between the two of them and kind of got an analysis there. I'm sorry, an analysis there. And I thank you for your time. How can these cats listening tonight, today, whenever they get the podcast, how can everybody find you and find your work? Yeah, the best place to, to find me uh, is on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Tometrix, uh, which is T-O-M-E-T-R-I-C-S. And uh, there, you know, I'll, I'll post um, 
you know, I'll, I'll post any any new stories or, or updates on on Football Outsiders content. And um, right now, I believe if you go to footballoutsiders.com, dot uh, I believe there's a, a sale right now on the almanac. So if you want to get caught up before the season starts, um, you can you can get a PDF copy there at a, at a discount. Uh, if you prefer uh, the the printed book, that's that's an option too. Uh, you can go to you know Amazon.com and and search for the uh, Football Outsiders Almanac 2020. Solid, so solid. Hey, before I get out of here, I just want to send condolences to the family of Cody Michael Williams. Cody was a member of the What the Buck charity group located in Tampa. Uh, known for their work, not just in Tampa, but throughout the world, their charitable contributions uh, to a bunch of different causes. Cody was a big, big part of that. Um, recognizable guy, one of the, literally one of their biggest members. Uh, I've only gotten a chance to speak to him a few times, but in those little short times, you know, it was, it was always a big smile. He was, you can see him, you know, passing out toys or beads or whatever to the smallest kids and everything and it was just kind of funny to see with his being you know such a such a big guy uh but he always had a had a smile on his, on his face when i saw him and that's a i mean that's it's kind of an image you you just can't forget and uh again we want to say condolences to his to his family uh the what the bug group uh and anybody who knew him uh if you guys can go over to the Facebook page, WTB Chatters, WTB Chatters, What the Buck Charity Group, and uh, show them some love and send their, send your condolences to his mom, Miss Jackie, uh, through that Facebook page if you can. Uh, again, love them while they hear y'all. Rest in peace, young Cody. <laughs>